Hello and welcome to the second part of my theater history lecture on English speaking theater of the 18th century. Let's get right to it. Actors and acting. There is a plethora of talented actors and actresses during this period, so let's get started. Um, we start to see a, a radical transformation of the craft of acting, as you will see, as we start to transition to a more realistic style of performance. Uh, there are some, at the beginning of the century, we have Thomas Betterton and Mrs. Bracegirdle, who are holdovers over some restoration theater, still being a big part of the scene. Between 1710 and 1735, however, we see some very fine actors associated with Drury Lane. The always great Collie Sibber, who we had mentioned before, Mr. Robert Wilkes, Thomas Dockett, and of course, the great comedian Anne Oldfield. Collie Sibber was a playwright, as we said. He also was an actor best known for playing fops in restoration comedy, sentimental comedy, and bourgeois tragedies. Um, Robert Wilkes, a transplant from Dublin, was also admired for his dashing young comic heroes, and Thomas Doggett was known as the finest low comedian of the day. And then there was Anne Oldfield, who was um, the successor to Anne Bracegirdle. Remember her, she is the um, restoration comedian. Uh, Anne Oldfield was enormously admired. She was considered the finest actress of high comedy in her day. So, but these lasted to about 1733, then they were either dead or retired. In the first part of the century, the 1740s, the only actor we really need to note is Mr. James Quinn. Quinn, another Dublin transplant, acted both at Drury Lane and Covent Garden. He was known both for tragic heroes and his comic portrayals of Falstaff. The style of acting up to this time had not changed since the Restoration, bombastic and declamatory. So, and Quinn was perfectly suited for that. He seems to have been particularly vehement in his tragic soliloquies. Here you can see uh, an engraving of James Quinn's and Coriolanus, who I'm sure he was much impassioned in his speeches. Um, as you can see, uh, by modern eyes, the costuming looks a little ridiculous, but at the time it's sort of the standard in theater. We'll chat a little bit more about that a little later. So actors distinguish between less important verse in the script and high points by delivering the former in a manner called level speaking, which is sort of what I'm doing now. In fact, I may be showing too much emotion and the latter with great emotion and increased volume. Actors sought to make points throughout the play for which they expected and often received applause. You can see um, actors working on the delivery in a green room in this uh, somewhat satirical drawing. However, around 1740, after James Quinn, the, this prevailing style was being challenged by two men who were going to be considered among the greatest actors of all time on the English stage. That's Mr. Charles Macklin and Mr. David Garrick. Let's start with Macklin. Charles Macklin, 1699 to 1797. No, that is not a typo. He actually lived to 97 years old in the 18th century. That in itself is a feat. He was born in Ireland, considered an Irish actor, and began acting in England around 1719. So basically he was a strolling player, um, a touring theater in a lot of illegitimate theater companies. He kept losing jobs because of his wild lifestyle and quarrelsome nature. He was hard to get along with. Around 1730, though, with some experience and some uh, word of mouth, he was able to join Drury Lane and was an actor manager there until 1734. His most renowned accomplishment came around 1741 with his revolution portrayal of Shylock and the Merchant of Venice. This is where he tried out this new experimental style that he thought would be all the rage. Now before in the Merchant of Venice, Shylock, the lawyer, the Jewish lawyer, had always been portrayed as a clownish buffoon with red hair and a large nose. So it's sort of um, a stereotype, sort of a, uh, very comical. But what Macklin did is observe English Jewish community and sought, sought to make the interpretation more realistic and more naturalistic. So he assembled what he thought was the appropriate costume for the character, a black gabardine ground, gown, long trousers, and a red hat. So instead of playing him as a low comedy clown, he made him a tragic figure. Um, it caused a sensation. It caused riots with the first audiences. Um, they weren't sure they liked this look at all. Also, his acting style was less bombastic. He used voice and gesture that were unique to the character. So this 
what I don't what's this guy doing? I don't know. I can't even. Eventually, though, he said, you know, this is a good interpretation. Um, and it started to catch on. And he won many adherents, many actors who said, I would like to do this, too. So he became a coach to a number of actors. And a book by John Hill was written about his methods called The Actor. So he is really the first modern actor to use observation and research to create a distinct character. Also is credited for ushering in a more naturalistic acting method, which suited his gift for mimicry. So for the rest of his career, he was known, he was forever linked with Shylock. Um, so he played that quite a bit. In fact, during this time, he introduced another innovation, the Star Contract, where he contracted to play an engagement for a short period of time for one play instead of being contracted for an entire season and a large number of plays. <clears throat> so, you know, this is this was a boon to actors who uh, had a following that he no longer was tied to a season, but he could go from place to place playing the same role and acting with different companies. Oh, he also wrote over 40 plays. Uh, plays which would be suited to his acting style. None are really of note, but um, they were pretty good. However, he was a jerk. Um, he would argue with anybody and everybody. Uh, so he, he with a lot of troops, with managers throughout the country. So he got a reputation as being sort of the Mickey Rourke of his generation. So in the last years of his life, he didn't get work. So because he had alienated so many people and he actually died penniless in 1797, again, at the ripe old age of 97. Amazing. However, he was a very influential actor, a very influential um, um, person in the craft of acting. And also he took the notice of a contemporary of his who also championed that more naturalistic style. And that contemporary is David Garrick who did not live to 97, who sadly died in the 60s, but is considered by many, be, by many to be the greatest of English actors and is credited as being the very first director. Uh, I know it's sort of um, subjective about who is the greatest actor when you really can't judge by performance. You have to uh, judge by testimonials and reviews by contemporaries. Oh, on to Garrick. He's the son of an army officer. He and his older brother were London wine merchants, and they had a wine bar, and they were acquainted with a number of actors of the day. Uh, in fact, they were theater junk, theater groupies, I guess you could say. And he liked to discuss theories over wine, particularly with people like Macklin. Who he Garrick appeared in a number of amateur productions himself. In 70, 1741, at the age of 24, he played Richard III at the unlicensed Goodman's Field. This was a performance that was so sensational that it was brought to notice of the authorities, and the theater was shut down. Now, as an actor, he was slender. He had medium build, expressive face, and dark, piercing eyes. Also, very good body control with very fluid stage movements. His voice was clear, articulate. However, it was not loud and booming, so it really wasn't suited to the old bombastic style of performance. So, a more natural style suited Garrick, both physically and vocally. So... Listening to uh, Macklin, he started observing, he started doing research, and he started on the idea that all his characters were unique. It is said he has been equally excellent at both comedy and tragedy, and due to an amazing memory, had a repertoire of over 90 roles in his head. So Now, that doesn't mean he, was, he was, um, had a perfect memory. Um, it just meant his memory is good. Of course, he'd have to review these roles, but um, that he kept them in his head at all is remarkable. After his success at Goodman Fields, he became a professional actor, leaving the wine business to his brother. He'd alternate between Drury Lane and Covent Garden. In 1747, he became a Drury Lane patent holder, and he managed there for over 25 years. And he is pretty much uh, responsible for the success of Drury Lane at that time and for its um, continuing operation to this day. It is why he was a manager there that he instituted a number of reforms. Most notably, he assembled a company of distinguished and disciplined actors. Not only was he an advocate for a more natural style, but he also impressed, stressed the importance of character development and research. He greatly extended the re rehearsal time from two weeks to eight weeks. Very strict disciplinarians, he urges actors to remember their damn lines, which we're always trying to do in this biz. Show up on time. Oh, please show up on time and act. Just not recite or mark, as we say today, during rehearsal. 
He also was interested in all the visual elements of the production. He traveled to Europe and brought back the latest scenic innovations. He banished spectators from the stage and experimented in lighting. He was very successful in his reform, although his actors did not entirely the old methods. Um, and not all spectators were happy with the more realistic approach. I didn't come to the theater to see realism. I came to be entertained and dazzled by um, witty and bombastic speech. However, he was the um, doyen of London society. Um, he was a very prolific playwright, writing original works, adapting Shakespeare, and so forth. He also gave um, a boost to the careers of several of his leading ladies. Um, chief among them was Susanna Sibber, who was the daughter-in-law of Collie Sibber, and Mrs. Hannah Pritchard. Mrs. Sibber appeared in many tragedies and melodramas with Garrick, including a celebrated turn in Otway's Venus Preserved, which we'll talk about in Lecture 12. Mrs. Pritchard was a renowned tragedian and who made Lady McBee so thoroughly her own that after her death, Garrick would not appear in the play ever again. His comic leading ladies included the great Peg Wolfington, known for her spirited heroines and breeches roles. Also, Kitty Clive, who excelled at farce, and Frances Abington, a hero, heroine of comedies of manners. So those reforms that uh, were previously mentioned are um, why Garrick is considered the first real director. Now, after he retired, the leadership and acting would pass to the Kimball family, who would dominate the next generation at the beginning of the 19th century. That will be covered in Lecture 13, which is English Theater of the 19th Century. However, the one performer we need to mention here is um, who was a Kimball, uh, Sarah Symbol, Sidden. Her maiden name was Kimball. Her married name was Sidden. Discovered while performing As You Like It in a Worcestershire barn at the age of 18, she was invited to perform at Drury Lane. She became the undisputed queen of tragedy. She wasn't very good at comedy, but she made tragedy her own. Particularly Lady McBee was one of her treasured roles. Also, she was a very beautiful woman and very graceful and sophisticated, and that attracted renowned portrait artist Thomas Gainsborough and Joshua Reynolds to paint her. <clears throat> we'll talk more uh, in detail about Sarah Siddons and her life and career when we get to the 19th century in Lecture 13. Now, we do need to talk about theater architecture, very important during this period. <clears throat> now, there were five theaters of note in the 18th century, Lincoln Inns Fields, Covent Garden, the King's Theater, the Haymarket, and of course, Drury Lane. Let's start with Lincoln's Inns Field for a bit. It was used by Thomas Betterton's Rebel Troop during the Restoration, stayed there till 1704. Then they went bankrupt. Christopher Rich says, well, I don't need any more. I want to raise it and erect a new theater, something a little more modern. Thank you. This had the same name until 1732, seated about 1400. Um, it was replaced in 1732 by Covent Garden. So again, tore it down, put up a new one, this under the management of the pantomimist John Rich. It held just under 1400, then in 1784 it was enlarged to hold 2500, and then they figured they could put in an extra 500 in 1792. So it was very popular, uh, prosperous theater until it burned to the ground in 1808. The King's Theater, which we're going to talk about, um, this was built in 1705 and from 1707 until it was gutted by fire in 1789. It was devoted entirely to opera with a seating capacity of 3,000. The Haymarket was built in 1720 and used by unlicensed companies until it was granted a license as a sum summer company in 1766, as you may remember to the one-footed Samuel Foote. Its seating capacity was 1,500. Here's a lovely picture of it, kind of an old-style horseshoe-shaped auditorium, quite large. It is also notorious for an incident in 1794 when 20 people were killed when a crowd pushed in to see George III, who was attending a performance. The Haymarket was successful until 1820 when it was replaced with a newer structure. As you can see here, this is the newer structure of the Haymarket that we are showing you. You can see less of the horse round sh uh, shape and a little more rectilinear. Okay, beginning of the 18th century, Drury Lane went bankrupt under Christopher Rich. But you got a new manager that same year remained in the re kept the restoration air seating capacity of 650 until 1775 when it was enlarged to 2300. It was torn down in 1794, rebuilt with a larger stage, it increased capacity of 36 and 3611 people, 
This stayed in operation until 1808. We'll talk about it more in the 19th century. <clears throat> Here you can see it after the remodeling. Much bigger auditorium, big stage. Now, most of these did retain the pit box gallery auditoriums from the restoration, um, but to accommodate more spectators, they shortened the apron. It now only extended 12 feet in front of the proscenium, where before it was usually 24 to 30. It had one door and one balcony on either side of the, the apron. Let me get, you can see here and here, and these are drops. So, and the apron remained the main playing area until 1760s. The depths of the stages increased as well, up to 50 feet to accommodate Italian scenery. Also, dressing rooms, scenery, sewers, facilities, scenery shops increased in size. However, by the 1790s, most of these theaters were considered old-fashioned and inadequate, and we start seeing the process of replacing them with larger, more elaborate buildings um, begin. Let's talk the audience's performances for a minute, shall we? Uh, by mid-century, performances were given just about every day of the week except Sundays and holidays. The season lasted from late September to early May. The summer season went from mid-May to mid-September. Upcoming performances are advertised in newspaper and announced from the stage each evening. Tonight, you are watching The Merchant of Venice. Tomorrow night, you will see Venus Preserved with Mr. Garrick and um, one of his leading, Mrs. Pritchard. Now, we do have lighting advances, which we'll talk a little bit about, which are candles, uh, usually with reflectors or some oil lamps, and this is why these theaters kept burning down. Usually, uh, curtain time was 6.15 or 6.30. Doors open hours before, so spectators would come get send servants to seat, uh, sit in the audience and get the best seats. Pretty complex bill. Uh, first was about half an hour of music. Then there was a prologue, usually connected thematically to the show, delivered by one of the leading actors or actresses. Then you have the main feature. Then you also have skits or musical entertainments in between the acts. Afterward, there's an afterpiece, a farce, a comic opera, or burlesque, usually the pantomime. Um, audience were passionate about their favorite plays, and performers were not shy about exp expressing their pleasure or displeasure. Riots were not uncommon. Spectators would storm the stage if there was a change of the bill, if there was a cast change. <clears throat> Look at this picture here. You can see their actors are storming the stage because they are very unhappy with the performance. And some are happy, so they're intervening here. Uh, I love this. The uh, conductor of the orchestra here has a bat, and he's knocking people back. So very lively theater there in the 18th century. Notable riots include an uproar over Macklin's first portrayal of Shylock and a, a riot at Haymarket over there being uh, cut out of, of uh, the Licensing Act of 1737. But the increasing popularity of theater led to the renovations of major theaters. Also, Taste of the Audience steered English drama further away from neoclassicism. Production values, very, very important. Um, we still have stock scenery with not a lot of new sets at the beginning of the century. Um, however, you start to see in the 1730s, John Rich borrowing from his success at Pantomime and inserting spectacle into existing plays. Before this, like I said, some wings, some drops, maybe a chair, uh, and anything that's sort of a spectacle or special effects is in the pantomime. But now you're starting to see this spectacle creep into plays. Here's an example. Uh, from Shakespeare, a procession and coronation in Henry VIII, and a funeral march in Romeo and Juliet. So, um, and these were enormously popular with 18th century artists, much so that by mid-century, scene painters were added permanently to theater staff at premium salaries. You can make a very good living as a scene painter. Also in 1749, John Rich brought designers, European designers schooled in the latest check, uh, techniques. One of these was Jean-Nicolas Servandoni, who is a renowned designer for the Paris Opera. However, the most influential Engl designer in England was a Frenchman, Philip de Lutherberg, hired by Garrick for Drury Lane in 1771. He had a salary of 500 pounds, which is twice as much as the highest paid performer. So today we could consider six figures at six figures, if not close to it. De Lutherberg mounted more than 30 productions over a span of 15 years. Also, he was responsible for new techniques and lighting effects. 
Also of note, he had his own little miniature theater, the Ido Fusicon, where he recreated remarkable spectacles without actors on a stage six by eight feet. So <clears throat> he also introduced a number of innovations to English stage. Foremost, he established a vogue for local color by recreating actual places. Amazingly, we don't think about this, but this has never been done before. We would research um, a place and then recreate it on stage. Uh, he's epitomized by um, a very popular play called The Wonders of Derbyshire, which is sort of a travelogue of that area. Um, here you see some paint elevations of that that, he would, that were used to create the scenery. Also, to increase illusion, he broke up the stage picture with ground rows and set pieces to gain a greater sense of depth. Also, he avoided the symmetry of wing and shutter scenery. And he liked to use miniature figures at the rear of the stage to depict crowds, armies, and sailing vessels. So just this whole panoply of things that he did to kind of create a more realistic and visually interesting stage picture. Most importantly... He achieved a unity of design by overseeing all the visual elements of the production, and all sets in the show were recreated in the same unified style. Now, before this, you might have mix and match. You would use stock scenery for your flats and your backdrop, and if one got damaged, a different artist, maybe even one decades later, would have to replace it, so you would get sort of this mishmash of uh, painting styles. But Deleutherberg made sure they were all in the same unified style, painted by the same scenic artists. It became very popular as it went on. Here we see uh, those those paint elevations from the previous slide. Here you see someone who made a model based on the elevations. So as you can see, quite an interesting stage picture there. Wreckage, a boat, um, some cliffs. So very interesting. We do have to note, however, that uh, part of the, this interest in local color and antiquities comes from the discovery of Herculaneum, Herculaneum in 1707. Uh, just a little background, Herculaneum is the sister city to Pompeii, Pompeii who were both um, perfectly preserved, almost perfectly preserved, when they were um, caught in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius back in ancient times. So uh, Herculaneum is being uncovered, all this information is coming in, and it's very fascinating. So it kind of gives rise to this new... Um, representation of real locales in the theater. Now, let's talk a little bit about his Ido Fusicon. Uh, he basically created as a way to experiment with stage machinery on a small scale. Uh, and if this would work, he would transfer it to a larger theater. It could hold about 150 uh, spectators. And we'd have these dramatic three-dimensional scenes presented complete with gears, pulley, lighting, and sound effects. It was built as a moving pictures representing phenomena of nature. One of the most successful was a scene based on a passage from Paradise Lost, depicting Satan gathering his troops in hell. Another popular one you see here, a computer rendering, was the wreck of the Halswell. In fact, um, you'll see in the links at the end of this lecture, there's a couple, of, there's a link to a recreation of this actual um, scene in uh, at the Ida Fusicon. Well, let's talk about the uh, wreck of the Halswell for a moment. It was said to be so realistic that one spectator claimed that he had to stop himself from crying hoarsely in terror. Most of the pieces were short, lasting only a few minutes, but they had a lasting impact on later scenography, particularly the spectacles of the 19th century. Here you see um, the quote-unquote backstage view of the wreck of the Halswell. Here's some endless, um, you would have rain, little BBs would travel down this, course that would do rain. Here you see two rotating um, sort of cylinders that recreate waves. Uh, here's a metal machine uh, right there that would uh, simulate thunder. And then these two uh, drums here would recreate the wind. Fascinating stuff. In today's costumes, we're going to talk very much about this. A little has changed. Since the restoration, actors supply their own wardrobe, whatever kind of looks like it was. Um, changes like Macklin's attempt um, to make a costume that's more fitting for Shylock. Um, maybe putting uh, the Scottish play hero in Scottish garb, like a kilt. <clears throat> but these weren't terribly popular. Garrett tried to create accurate clothing, um, but a lot of his actresses would not have it. 
uh, there's not a lot of research. It's very expensive. And then there are actresses, particularly actors and actresses, but particularly actresses like uh, this Queen Boudica here who had their costumes and by God, they were not going to part with them. Thank you very much, Mr. Garrick. Now this changed a little bit in the 1750s. We have um, some books on costuming uh, historical patterns, historical paintings that show a wealth of detail. A French book released in England in 1757. I'm not going to embarrass myself um, by trying to re-pronounce uh, re it, but it had historical patterns based on portraits by Holbein, Van Dyck, etc. The second one I can pronounce is Joseph, Joseph Strutt's The Dress and Habits of the Peoples of England, which provided historical accurate information on British fashion. So these are good, and they will start changing slowly the costuming industry in English theater. We do see a lot of lighting innovations, uh, which I want to talk briefly about because I'm running out of time here. Uh, we start to see oil lamps replace candles. Um, we start to see lights mounted on vertical ladders behind wings. Dim by scene blinds, metal shields that were placed between the sage and the light source. We start to see footlights on, mounted on pivots that could be lowered below stage level for dimming. So, But again, these are open flames, hence a lot of theaters burned down. Garrick introduced a number of innovations because, of course, he did. He's Garrick, chief among them removing all visible light sources from the stage, increasing brightness with improved reflectors, and popularizing the system of rotating light ladders. De Lutherberg used silk screens to reflect light and transparent silk filters to control light color. The biggest break came in 1785 with the introduction of the Argand or patent lamp, uh, which had a longer light, longer lasting, brighter, steadier light at a lower temperature. You can see it has a chimney that could be colored for effects. Um, <clears throat> so you start to see more light. So you can have deeper stage. You can get behind the proscenium now and off the apron. To, um, also, we start to see budget increases uh, in lighting because there's a growing interest in stage lighting. So, for instance, around 1745, you might see theaters spending 340 pounds a year. By the 1770s, you're up to almost 2,000 pounds. So, markedly increased interest in lighting. So, that means theaters can move later performance times. So you could put more action behind the proscenium, which I just said. Um, we still have chandeliers used on stage as you can see here. Also in the house, you didn't really dim the house. You still had an illuminated house. Um, but again, oil lamps, flats made of fabric, curtains all together spell fire. So that's why we have so many fires. Colonial America, look at this, theater in America. Look at that, man. The earliest recorded interest of an English performance in America was from 1665. Three men in Virginia were hauled into court for performing a play like The Bear and the Cub. Does it say why they were hauled into court? Um, obviously, it was an unlicensed theater, but I guess that was it. But by the end of the century, we were starting to see some neoclassical plays that were performed at both Harvard and William and Mary, which I think is probably the only two colleges in America at that time. By the early 18th century, we have a number of professional actors coming over from England to form small companies. The first was in Williamsburg. First theater was built in Williamsburg, of course, in 1716. We start to see a lot of English companies coming over because it's, you know, to make ends meet. This is fertile new ground. So they come over from England, try to make their living in America. 1749, Walter Murray and Thomas Keene form a company, a professional company in Philadelphia. They had to tour. They toured from New York to Virginia, offering a menu of shows at each town. So the first troupe to perform a season of some length in America that stayed together. The most important contribution, however, was made by the Hallam family. William Hallam managed an unlicensed theater in England for 10 years, New Wells Theater, until they finally found him out and it was shut down. What you gonna do? Well, he organized a sharing plan, got a troupe together, and went to America, where there is no central licensing agency. Twelve adults and three children, led by his brother Lewis, including his wife, Mrs. Hallam, and their children, Lewis Jr., Hallam, Adam, and Helen. They landed in Williamsburg in 1752 and opened with The Merchant of Venice. It was a big hit. They toured the East Coast for three years. Lewis performing the secondary rows. Mrs. Hallam is the leading lady. 
Um, so they were quite successful. They introduced the colonies not only to Shakespeare, but to Kali Sibber, Thomas Otway, George Lillo, the Restoration comedy writers, and so on. So very influential in America. William Helen is often acknowledged as the father of the American stage. Now, in 1755, though, um, they did have a little trouble getting permission to perform in some towns in America, so they tried Jamaica for a while. And here they met another English actor trying to make his way in the New World, David Douglas, who was trying to re recruit his own company. Douglas joined the company, and when Lewis died in 1756, Douglas married Mrs. Hallam, 1758, so there was a respectful distance, took over their troupe, and renamed it the American Company. They were able to come back to America proper in 1758 and toured successfully until 1775, so much that Douglas built two theaters, the Southwark Theater in Philadelphia and the John Street Theater in New York. They were modeled after the London theaters, but they were a little smaller. The population, of course, isn't as large over here in the 18th century, particularly early 18th century. Uh, American Company was very similar to a provincial English company, having to tour, but they were successful. And Mrs. Hallam was a, a attractive, graceful, and talented actress. Very good uh, with her Shakespearean heroines, particularly Cordelia, Juliet, Desdemona. Some towns had ecclesiastical objections. They did not want these amoral theater actors coming to their town and stirring up trouble. So they said, well, how about we do some moral dialogues? Also, uh, the company thrived under Lewis Hallam Jr., who took up when he came of age. He was a very good actor, very distinguished and versatile, and in much demand. He started the first produ professional production of an American play, Thomas Godfrey's The Prince of Parthia, in 1767. I believe it is not extant. I don't think there's any copies that you can get nowadays. But it was the only professional company for a while. Um, operating consistently. All that stopped in 1775 with the start of the revolution. Um, after the war, uh, actually towards the end of the war, I mean in the late 1770s, early 80s, there was a small flurry of American drama being written, mostly spar farce and satire. The most successful was probably Robert Munford's The Patriot, a satire about super patriots who label all opponents as enemy, enemy agents and in today's vernacular canceled them. Here's some links that I have, uh, scenes from Merchant of Venice, Al Pacino and David Suchet versions, which are very good. It shows the versatility of Shylock and um, what we owe to Charles Macklin. Here's a YouTube describing a recreation of the wreck of uh, the Halswell, uh, Ido Fusicon, and then a very good little tutorial on making an 18th century mechanical theater. This ends lecture seven, uh, 11, not 17, I'm not there yet. This ends lecture number 11. I hope it had some use for you. Thank you.